Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Fathers, we bow in your presence today. Thank you so much for our Savior. Thank you for loving us in such a way that you would give your Son to die for our sins. We pray, Lord, that everyone here today knows personally what it means to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. We pray that you would be with those of our number who have recently said goodbye to a loved one. We ask that you would offer them your peace and your comfort. Help us to minister to them as a congregation, as individuals who love them, as they grieve. Dear Lord, we pray for others who are sick and have special needs. We pray that you would just be with them. Help those who are their caregivers. Give them knowledge and wisdom and the skills to treat them. And Father, we thank you so much that we have a hope that goes beyond this veil of tears. Father, we pray that you might be honored as we worship here today, in Christ's name, amen. We're going to be sharing today from Acts chapter 2 primarily, Acts the second chapter, as we talk about the message of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. Pentecost was actually 50 days after Passover. In the Old Testament, Passover was observed in commemoration of the beginning of the Hebrews' exodus from Egypt. Now, the Jews celebrated the Feast of Weeks, also called the Feast of Harvest, 50 days after Passover. And of course, uh, Pentecost is a, a Greek term that basically means 50 so this was a celebration of the first fruits, that is the Feast of Weeks or Feast of Harvest, was the celebration of the first fruits of the spring grain harvest and the calling of the Hebrews into a covenant relationship with the Lord on Mount Sinai. And we read about it in Deuteronomy 16 and 10, as well as Exodus 34 and 22. Interesting to know that Jesus was crucified during Passover. John the Baptist called Jesus, quote, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We read about that in John chapter 1, verse 29. And then Jesus rose on the third day following his death and burial and appeared numerous times to his followers for a period of 40 days after his resurrection. In fact, we read about that in Acts, the first chapter. The Apostle Paul tells us in his writing to 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, that the risen Jesus appeared to more than 500 followers at once. And in fact, he said, while he was writing this, he said that most of them were still alive while he was writing this. And so... There was a confirmation. It wasn't just Paul saying this. There were numerous witnesses of the resurrected Christ. And during this time, this span, this brief 40-day span after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus met with these individuals here and there, and he told them that in a very brief time, that his followers would be baptized by the Holy Spirit, just like John the Baptist had foretold would happen. 
And the Lord stated, you will receive power, and this is in Acts 1 and 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, 10 days after Christ ascended into heaven was the Feast of Harvest or Pentecost. Okay. 50 days after Passover. And during that time, devout Jews from around the known world gathered around Jerusalem. They came like uh, on a missionary journey, if you will, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Harvest or the first fruits. Sometimes there was as many as 200,000 people who swelled the population of Jerusalem during this period. And it was just at that time that the Holy Spirit came upon 120 followers of Jesus who were gathered in Jerusalem. And all of them were told in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 21 and 22, he said this, In the law it is written, through men of strange tongues and through lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. Who was he talking to? What people? To the Jewish people. Okay. He says, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. This was found in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12. Tongues then are a sign, Paul went on to say, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So then the Holy Spirit's enabling of these 120 followers of Christ Jesus to speak languages that they had not heard or learned was a sign to the unbelieving Jews who were present. It was a sign. You remember God said through Isaiah the prophet and Paul quoted him that he was going to speak as a sign for not for believers but for unbelievers and specifically a sign to the Jews and so this event captivated those who were present because here we see at least 14 different nationalities and languages that are actually mentioned in Acts chapter 2 and here were these most of them many of them from Galilean uh, they were what we would uh, call, they were the Ozarkians of that area of Palestine. And they were able to speak these different languages that they had not studied or learned. And it captivated those people from around those regions that they were actually speaking in a language they understood. And it was their own national language. Rather than in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. As Luke records in Acts chapter 2 verses 12 and 13. He says, amazed and perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? Some, however, of course, made fun of them. They said, well, they've, they've had too much wine. That is, they're saying, how is this possible? How could these people have known all the other languages that they were speaking? Well, Peter must have noticed, you know, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good invitation for me to tell them what's going on. And so what does he do? He stands up along with the other 11 apostles and didn't hesitate to use that opportunity to share with them the gospel of Christ Jesus. He first, of course, dismissed the idea that these people were drunk, but then he confronted this group of individuals with prophecies by Joel and by King David. 
In other words, he, he pointed them. Remember, this was a group who had traveled, for many of them, had traveled many miles to celebrate this Feast of Harvest. And so they were devout Jews, and they would be familiar with Joel, and of course with David and his writings, for example, in the Psalms. They would be familiar with that. And Peter takes note of this, and so he confronts them with these prophecies by Joel and King David. He began with Joel's prophecy recorded in Joel chapter 2, a passage well known by these Jewish people. And he said that what they were witnessing was the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy regarding the last days. And by the way, in the Bible, the last days began when Jesus ascended into heaven. The last day started. And so we're living today in the last days. Jesus also promised to send the Holy Spirit, whose role was going to be to witness and to glorify Him. We read about that time and again in John chapter 14, John chapter 15, and then as we already mentioned in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to receive power to be my witnesses. And so the Holy Spirit's role would also not only be a role to empower those who were trusting in Christ to be witnesses, but also, Jesus said, one of the roles and means of the Holy Spirit would be to convict of sin and of judgment. But Peter really began to personalize his message to this crowd, calling attention to what they already knew about Jesus of Nazareth. What did they know? Well, he addressed the person of Jesus. He said, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. That's in chapter 2 of Acts, verse 22. He said, look, I'm gonna, I want to talk to you about a person that you're, uh, you're familiar with, you've heard about, some of you perhaps more than others, but you have a, a working knowledge of Jesus of Nazareth. I think it's important that we recognize the fact that these individuals were not just coming and hearing about Jesus for the first time. They were familiar with those who had actually, and many of them probably had actually observed some of the signs and miracles that God had given to really show that Jesus was him, as, as he mentioned Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. And so he's saying, look, you already have met or heard of this Jesus. You're, you're familiar with him somewhat. We have to ask ourselves, what do you who are here today know about Jesus? What have you already heard about Jesus? Then I want to ask you this question. How are you responding to what you already know about him? Think about that. You've heard about Jesus. How are we responding to what we already know about him? Now, Peter went on to tell them that God had a plan, a plan for this Jesus of Nazareth. Showing them the problem of their own guilt. Saying in verse 23, This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Boy. wonder how it'd be if this preacher got that plain. And you, just start pointing out, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. That's pretty plain speaking, isn't it? And you, you're the ones, now think about this. Here is a guy that not long ago was scared to admit he knew Jesus. You remember before Jesus was crucified while he's being 
held on trial? You remember what Jesus said? I don't know the man. I don't know him. No, it's not. I, I don't know the man. And then he began to, uh, to basically uh, get nasty. And here's a man now who's willing to stand between, before thousands and preach the truth of the gospel of Christ. You have to ask, what's the difference in this man? This man had met the risen Christ. This man had been filled with the spirit that Christ sent. And he was a changed man. He was a new man. He knew about Jesus. He knew a lot of things. He ministered alongside Jesus. But now, he's been empowered by Jesus through his spirit. And he's giving this this testimony, and by the way, as we mentioned before, the, uh, the, the other apostles are standing there saying amen and adding to whatever he didn't, didn't say. Peter says God had a plan for this Jesus of Nazareth. And he began to show them the problem of their own guilt. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. One of the interesting things here we find is both the sovereign will of God and the free will of humanity working in conjunction to accomplish the purpose of God. You see, God knows all things past, present, and future. He knew exactly how the individuals of that time would respond. He knew there wasn't any doubt how the cross would come about. He knew all of that. As it saw, he says, God, in his set purpose and foreknowledge, and foreknowledge, he knew. He wasn't surprised. But, his, but God knowing did not determine the actions of the people. Just because God knows what we're going to do and how we think doesn't mean He's forcing us to think that way. You see, we were created with the ability to choose. And if we didn't have the ability to choose, then God could not really fairly, justly hold us accountable for what we can't determine to do on our own. I mean, wouldn't, I mean even, even the most... Um, degenerate of individuals would recognize that. Right? If you can't do any other than that. But God gave us the ability to choose. Right or wrong. And they chose to crucify Him. So Peter is clearly informing them of just who this Jesus of Nazareth is. And he shows them their guilt in ignoring God's numerous attempts to demonstrate to them by miracles, wonders, and signs that Jesus is the Christ. But then he goes on to show them the proof of the resurrection of Jesus. But let me mention, you say, well, but pastor, you know, I haven't seen those miracles and those signs and those wonders like those folks did. But you know, you believe a lot of things that you haven't seen. You believe it on the testimony of others. I want to see your hands. How many of you believe that our first president in America was named George Washington? If you believe that, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Now, how many of you ever saw George Washington? What made you come to that belief? through the witness, the testimony of other people who said, I know him. And it went on and on and on till it got to us. You see. So, it isn't unusual for us to believe things that we have not personally seen and heard. That's what this book's about. God personally sent us a message 
inspired of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit who came down on Pentecost and filled these 120, the same Spirit that captivated their attention, the same Spirit that inspired these men, Peter and the eleven, to preach to them the message of the gospel of Christ, the same Spirit who calls individuals today who trust Jesus, who love Jesus, to share the gospel with others so that they can come to know Jesus. That same spirit is alive and well today. Now Peter goes on to show some proof of the resurrection of Jesus. He first quotes from King David in Psalm 69, 25. And let's look at that as he mentions it in Acts chapter 2, beginning in the 29th verse. I'm sorry, the 25th verse. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, Paul reassures them. He says, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. In other words, hey guys, we can go find it right here. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. And seeing what is ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Why? What did he he say? He says, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And so, he was not abandoned to the grave, and his body did not see decay. And then he says, in addition to that, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of this fact. He's pointing out, we, all of these 120 that you have seen and heard, we're all witnesses to a resurrected Jesus. He's alive. And then he goes on a little further. He said, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are witnesses of this fact. And not only has Jesus been resurrected, he also has ascended to sit at the right hand of God, which David also prophesied. And we read in verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out What you now see and hear, for David did not ascend to heaven. And yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. At this... The crowd was convicted. They were convicted. Verse 37 says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Remember, they first said, What does this mean? Now they know what it means. They says, What shall we do? Let me tell you, folks, I pray that every time you hear a message, every time you read from God's word on your own, you need to ask, Not only what does this mean, but what shall we do? What shall we do with now what we know? What shall we do with this? Now listen to what Peter told them about this particular message. They were compelled by the apostles to repent, to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. But it didn't stop there because verse 40 says, and with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. 
Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Okay, so there's repentance. That's turning away from sin unto Christ. And a deep sorrow and remorse. Not, morally, not merely a regret that you've been caught up. But a desire to be different. Desire to please God. And then of course. He says. Having believed. You should be baptized. What was that? That was an open public confession. An open public confession of identifying themselves with Jesus. With His death, their belief in His death, burial, and resurrection for their sins. And for their being also dying to sin and raised to a new life. That was the picture that their baptism would portray. It was a visual picture of a spiritual reality. And then he went, they went on to say, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Now, what does he mean, save yourselves? Well, only Christ can save us from our sins. What he's saying is, look, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to be different. You're going to have to be different from this corrupt generation. You're going to have to be different from what you used to be. You're going to have to change some things in your life because of Christ in your heart. And it says that those that were converted, those who responded appropriately to God's call, to them through the message of the gospel. They received the forgiveness of their sins. Verse 38. Peter said if you'll do this. You'll be forgiven. And they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verses 38 and 49. You will receive the gift of the Spirit. Because this promise is not only to you. But to all your children. And all who are far off. For whom God our Lord will call. That means that. All of us here today, all of us here today can experience the forgiveness of our sins and the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. That transforming power of God's Spirit that not only changes the the person that we are or were from inside out, but it also makes us witnesses. Witnesses. Because God has given us power. Sometimes you say, well, well Pastor, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, but I, I'm, I just really don't know what to say. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to kind of be helpful to my friends or, you know, to co-workers and this one and that one. Listen, the Holy Spirit is a power within you and enables you and me to be the witnesses that we need to be. Now, that may, you may be a better witness in a few days than you are today. How do you get to be a better witness? Well, you get closer to the Lord. And how do you do that? Well, you walk in His Word. You get in His Word. You find out what the Lord says. And the Holy Spirit will bring those things to mind. Listen, better than any argument that I can make is the argument of this Word right here. It isn't my words that can change your life. Oh, I can persuade people to do this or to do that. But it really takes the power of the gospel message to truly change a heart and life. To not just manipulate people. You know, all of us, we have maybe skills to manipulate people. But listen, we don't need manipulation. What we need is transformation. And that happens only through the power. Of Jesus. The Bible tells us that on this occasion, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Man, they were busy, weren't they? I don't know if that, they all got baptized that same day, we don't know, but 3,000 people accepted the Lord Jesus. Now that's really an amazing thing, but you have to remember, 
How many of them didn't accept Jesus? 3,000. Remember what we told you? How many swelled Jerusalem? There were probably thousands more who heard the same message. Saw the same event. The same sign that these 3,000 saw. But they did not come to Jesus. I pray that there's nobody here today who has heard the message of the gospel and has, and has not accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh God, thank you for sending us Jesus. Thank you for the gospel message, Lord. I know how at times when my life has not been right with you, how you have convicted me. Thank you for convicting me that you might turn me in the right direction. Dear Lord, perhaps there's some here today who need to say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Perhaps there's believers here today who say, Lord Jesus, I have your spirit in my life, but I haven't really, really allowed your spirit to have free reign in my heart. And I haven't been the faithful witness that you've enabled me to be. Lord, this very day, May we all respond to your message and your grace by faith. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.